Welcome to Constant Curiosity, a trauma-informed podcast. My name is Kathy Hart, and I will be your host for the next three episodes, which will feature some colleagues of mine here at Star Commonwealth, and we're going to be providing you with a fresh perspective on challenging behavior. In part one, we're going to be looking at behavior through a trauma-informed lens, and what does that really mean? Part two is going to be a conversation about helping support the staff mindset shift Um, to a more trauma-informed, resilience-focused mindset. And part three is gonna be talking a little bit more about behavior management, some tools and scenarios that can help uh, help you when you're dealing with some challenging or unwanted behaviors. And so a little bit about me, your host, Kathy Hart, is I have been working with children and families, wow, for a lot, a lot of years, about 27 years now. Uh, So I have lots of experiences uh, that I can uh, share with you about my time working with troubled children and family. Just a little bit more about me. I have a master's degree in professional counseling. I kind of grew up professionally at Star Commonwealth. I'm going on my 25th year here at Star Commonwealth. And I often joke and say that um, I am the poster child for problems or opportunities as an employee. They've given me lots of opportunities uh, to overcome some challenging situations myself. Um, So I was a counselor, a therapist, a supervisor, and actually our guest of our first episode, I was actually his supervisor at once. So, well, actually two of the three guests. And so uh, we have a longstanding relationships of working through a lot of challenging behaviors. And now I'm the director of training and program consultant for Star Commonwealth. I get the joy of traveling all over the country again, um, just hearing what's going on in California or New York uh, or working virtually with trainers from all over the world. And so I train all of our trainers as well. So I really enjoy hearing from people all over the world about what their challenges are in their current current school systems, how they're overcoming those challenges. And then I get to share a lot of those experiences with all of you. So let's get right into our first episode here. Um, Like I mentioned, the, the... Part one of our podcast is we are going to dig into looking at behavior through a trauma-informed lens. And I have my friend, maybe, um, or more colleague, uh, Tony Bentley here with me. Tony and I worked in a residential program together where it was a private pay boarding school for kiddos uh, that were really struggling. um, uh, Either they were on the autism spectrum and struggling in their school systems or just about any kind of issue you can think of with a young person where they might benefit from being in a different uh, strength-based environment. We worked together uh, for many years there and have lots of fun things that I'm sure you'll hear about. A brief introduction of of you and maybe how you got here. Yeah, uh, my name is Tony Bentley. I uh, went to school uh, at Western Michigan University, go Broncos, got my degree in psychology. And took my first big boy job uh, at Montcalm Schools, which was a program at Star Commonwealth. Um, and then I felt feel like uh, was kind of you know making my way, figuring some things out from the kids and staff. Uh, of course, um, Kathy came in and got me thinking correct about some things and <laughs> trying to uh, trying to approach things the right way. But no, I've uh, I've been fortunate and blessed to be able to work with a lot of different children who have, have taught me a lot about just human beings and what we need and what we're looking to accomplish and how are we maybe getting in our own way at times or how are we expressing ourselves. Um, So I've been in the field for about 16 years. Um, Still feel like I learn something every day. I think if we stop learning something every day, then we're we're probably not doing our job. But uh, it's it's pretty amazing to be a part of this work and and this organization. Um, And I've, I've also grown up in Star Commonwealth essentially. So um, I just feel very fortunate to have the information I do have, and then I just try to keep in mind, um, you know, this work, work can be challenging, but yeah. it's super rewarding. Yep. And if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. And if it was easy, you probably wouldn't have as much of a need. So sure. um, I think it's just a, it's a calling, you know, and um, yeah, I'm just really happy to be doing this for a living and, and also be here to speak with you about it. So when we first met, it was 2010. Yeah. I remember that year just because it's a nice round number. Um, but yeah, I moved up to the Michigan campus and was working here. And I think about um, tra- trauma-informed resilience focus. I remember the first time I ever heard or talked to Dr. Soma was right before we moved up here, when when Star first became more affiliated with what was then called the Trauma and Loss Center and Children, um, Trauma and Loss and Children. And um, so we weren't always trauma-informed. So I want to make sure our audience knows that that we were on this journey as well, and we continue to be on the journey. Like I'm not exaggerating when I say every day I'm reading 
um, new articles or information about what brain science is telling us about trauma and resilience. And so we're still on this journey. So I want to make sure our audience knows um, that Tony and I didn't start at Star Commonwealth, these enlightened, trauma-informed beacons of light and hope. <laughs> Right. We can think of many times where we may not have been beacons of light and hope. Right. It's humbling. <laughs> it's humbling. So we have been on this trauma informed journey ourselves. And, and we're so fortunate to have Dr. Soma and her knowledge and, and Dr. Bill Steele at that time's knowledge about becoming trauma informed. But that kind of I was kind of setting up for our first question here, which is when you reflect on that path. So you think back to when you first started at Star Commonwealth, we weren't really focusing a lot on trauma-informed. It was just starting to, to create, to, be, to become evident in our residential programs. What has that journey been like from that moment when you first started at Montcalm, your first big boy job, as you put it, which I would counter that you haven't had that yet, but moving on. <laughs> um, <laughs> but like, what has that journey been like going from your first day to you're the trauma-informed professional and resilience-focused professional you are now? Yeah, I, I feel like... Um you know, and I am still in a work, work in progress yeah. when it comes to all of this. But just looking back at when I first started um, to now, I think the biggest thing is all of the really puzzling questions that you have about kids' behavior. M most of them, the vast majority of them, I feel like they can be answered if you're looking through this lens. Mm -hmm. And not having that initially, I think led to a lot more frustration on my part and That's probably so frustration on the student's part because, yeah. um, you know, we, I was dealing with the behavior, the, 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 ice, the tip of the, the iceberg, iceberg that's sticking yeah. out, right? And this is something that you taught me, right? What's underneath that water? And what is the kid communicating to you through their behavior that they are either not able to or don't want to say through their words? And how do we help them identify I'm in and I'm having a sensory experience with a situation and this makes sense. This is how a normal person would react um, in this circumstance. If I if they'd been through what I'd been through, this is how a lot of people could react. And then just talking about resilience as sort of the pathway, you know, that's that's sort of like what we look at to overcome these challenges and not label myself a victim of my circumstances, but a survivor. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and kids get this concept when we start talking about it. And it's really cool to watch them give themselves start giving themselves credit for, OK, I'm not perfect, but I'm getting out of bed. I'm showing up. Mm -hmm. I'm listening. Right. I still might have these challenges, but how how far have I come? What have I had to survive through and how has that impacted how I'm dealing with behavior? So I still encounter situations every day where I have those questions, but thankfully I have a little bit more of a roadmap to go. Not what's wrong with, you know, what's wrong with you? Right. Not what's wrong with you, but what happened? Right. What happened to you? What am I missing? Um, because. I think part of that, that trauma-informed lens is understanding that if a kid could do better and be successful with the tools that they currently have, they would, right? They would. Absolutely. And so I think a lot of our frustration comes from just assuming that they're sabotaging themselves or sabotaging relationships. They know better. They can right. do better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, especially I think when you incorporate concepts around the circle of courage to that. For sure. Our need for a sense of belonging as human beings, especially if you talk about teenage human yeah. beings, um, is so overwhelming. It will override a lot of your, your natural tendencies to keep yourself safe, right? And I think we discount that. I, I know I've been guilty of that as an adult, discounting how much they want to fit in or be accepted by other kids. But it's probably like their first through third priority on their list of important things. Especially if you have a sense of belonging which yeah. you do have a sense right. of belonging, right? With your family, your community. Yeah. And so it's easy for those of us that have a healthy sense of belonging to discount the, the, the need and the drive to find that for kids who don't have that. Yeah, just yeah, to be accepted right. for who you right. are. Yeah. Or like, yeah. oh, that's Kathy. She's got great insight and she's very funny. And <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, uh, but like just to have people acknowledge your gifts and what you bring to your group, your tribe, whatever it is. And, and I think, that so many kids would make so many sacrifices just to have a tribe, just to have a group yeah. of other people that will care about them mm -hmm. and accept them for, for who they are and what they bring. And, and I think just those little pieces of insight, um, it doesn't always answer all the questions, but it at least puts you on the road to go, okay, well, how do I provide that sense of belonging for that young person 
in a way that's going to set them up for success or an avenue where they can use their God-given skills and talents and all of these things that they bring to be accepted for who they are versus trying to fit some mold of what they think people want them to be. You said something when you first started, and I've been trying because you're saying so many awesome things. I'm like, I want to talk about that. I want to talk about that. But you said something that I think we really need to hone in on is, and I'm going to, I probably screw up how you said it, but what would have, where would I have been if I'd been through that? Something like that. Like these kids grow up in situations, a lot of our kids are growing up in situations that are scary, that are detrimental. And the question that I think one of the things that about trauma informed resilience approach that really struck me was, wouldn't it be more abnormal or more weird to not have a response to that? These are life survival skills. And you think about some of the kids we worked with and some that you're currently working with, yeah. their coping skills that are what we call unwanted or challenging behaviors is what's kept them alive yeah. to get where they are. And we call that PTSD with the D being disorder. Why is it a disorder? That's a normal response to life-threatening situations and we are calling it a disorder. Yeah. And it's probably not the worst case scenario for that kid. You know what I mean? Like um, a kid being passive aggressive, for example, maybe pretending they don't hear you and don't hear your directions. What? That can, yeah, exactly, <laughs> right? I don't know, we're gonna fight, right? No, but like that will drive 95% of adults up the wall, right. right? Okay, but what if the kid's issue instead was about self-harm? Wouldn't that be more serious? Right. Or what if their issue was about assaulting other people? Or, you know what I mean? So it's like, I think it's a game of inches that we play and then being able to make sure that you, every day we have conversations, we just had one today where we're like, can you believe how well this young lady's doing? With this, this, and this. And you know, this behavior that we used to see all the time, we haven't seen anymore. I, I think we have to be able to like pull that ruler out more consistently for our kids and for ourselves and go, all right, look, we're not perfect, but look where we started. Right. And, and look how your relationships have improved. And as we started having this conversation, I was having it with Katie. And she's like, yeah, did you notice? Like, she's just a little bit more put together too. Like, and we started really talking about it. And you could see her self-confidence manifest itself in a whole lot of different areas that were all going to benefit that child. And we talk about when she came into the program and about how challenging some of those behaviors were and how disruptive they were for her and about how they affected the relationships. And we talked about as a team, how do we, how do, we do that? How did we get here with her? And I, somebody on the team said, I think it was just about relationships. I think it was just about carrying her through this, right? Like, nope, like, look, we don't love the behavior, but we care about you. And we're gonna be here right. every day, smiling. How you doing today, right? Can't wait to help you out. Um, if you come up and you wanna follow up about something that you did yesterday, fantastic, right? Like that is awesome. And we also talked about how she's gotten really good at repair, okay? So if you can't, if you can't completely avoid making mistakes and damaging relationships, at least get really good at the repair. And she's gotten to the point where she'll just kind of initiate, she was initiating this with the teacher at her school, right? And so it's so cool to know that like, we, we make this progress, but we don't always give ourselves credit or students. And, and, mm -hmm. and so we have to, I think, really look at the spectrum of, of what kids are doing. And is it moving to, more towards them being happy, healthy, successful, all those things. So. Yeah, so I love that you said a game of inches and I'm gonna steal that, but I won't give you credit. because that's, that's fair. That's just, I, I, I steal stuff that. from you all the time. I know, so. I know we're good. So, sorry. <laughs> anyway. So I think about like the process of change and we have a whole content on this in that coach curriculum that we, we were together with, right? That Kubler-Ross change curve is that what, there's nothing in life. I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Maybe there's a few things that change is instantaneous. It doesn't happen, right? Change is incremental. It's a game of inches. But when we're working with kids in some of our educational systems, we'll, you know, a plan will be implemented and for two weeks, and that means maybe five out of the 10 days it's been done. Yeah. And we, it doesn't work, yeah. right? Throw their hands up, it doesn't work. But what in life is instantaneous, right? Like you said, it's a game of inches, everything. And it's about, and I've heard, I've heard from some, I think, reliable sources that you all at where you're working at the Resilient Empowerment Center talk about progress over perfection, that it needs to be yeah. those game of inches is like, yeah, yeah what's the pop? You know, what's the pop for the day is that the girl came together, came with her hair combed or she had her shoes tied or just the small things that over time, how did we get here? Yeah. 
yeah. and you go back and you look. And so I think that was really insightful, and that's something that all of our listeners can take away from is, we're, what inch did we make today? Yeah. The repair, right? Yeah. So maybe they acted out again, but the repair was there. Well, you, I'll give you credit. I'll give you some credit here. Okay? You gave me the <laughs> feedback, right? It's, it's a real thing. It's like sometimes it's not like did Billy not cuss us out today. Sometimes it's Billy cussed us out for five minutes a day when it was 30 yeah, minutes last right, week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was really hard for me as a young person coming out of college. And some would say neurotypical, I guess. You might argue with that, right? <laughs> but like it's really hard for me to at that point to show the maturity to go, you know what, you're right, right? I'm still just like stuck on like, but yeah, they're, but they're still cussing. But um, I mean, we have to be able to hold those wins up for ourselves as in terms of working in the field, but Good also point, yeah. for those children, right? We have to be that sort of mirror that they can check in and go, okay, but look, you know? And when I took that philosophy on, cause I've stolen that from you, okay? <laughs> we're, we're mutual in that regard. Um, when, I've, when I've taken that, and I've given the kid feedback. Hey, you did a great job today. And they're like, but dude, I cussed you out for mm -hmm. five minutes. Yeah, but last week it was a half an hour. Mm -hmm. And you didn't even go into my family this time. You just called me like, <laughs> you know, generic like insults or whatever. Right. It's kind of mind blowing for them. Yes. Um, to, and, and I really think it does a lot for, for our credibility as adults mm -hmm. with kids. Um, it sure does. Because like, I think a lot of kids whether right, wrong, or indifferent, their perception of adults is they want to be petty. They want to find every reason to like give me negative feedback. Mike makes right. I'm the boss. Yeah. Adultism. You know, and sometimes we do fall into those silos, right? And so, um, I think that that ability to take that strength-based approach of not it's not a light switch, but it's a dial, right? And like, where did we turn the dial today? Um, I think those those are a lot of the things that I've been able to take and implement with kids that have come from this trauma-informed lens that have served me very well in terms of my ability to build relationships with kids um, across the board. Yeah, absolutely. And I wanted to go back to also something else that you mentioned is when you said, like, how did the girl get here? And you said, you know, the response from your team was, was, was some connections and relationships. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to, this is a point I make a lot when I'm training is when we talk about you know, we have this training, 10 steps to a trauma-informed school. Steps one and two are about resilience and trauma. Step three, the very first intervention step is about creating connections or relationships with kids because that is so foundational to who we are as human beings. And you talk about the circle of courage, right? That's about creating a felt sense of belonging. We need to start with belonging and connection right away. And so that's, and a lot of times people think that, you know, um, I'll hear comments like, well, we need more uh, school counselors and social workers and this kid needs more therapy. That might be true, but they also might just need some more human connection as well. Yeah. Which doesn't take our degrees in psychology. Yeah. Right? No. They, they might just need somebody who says, hey, how was your weekend? Mm -hmm. You got anything fun coming up? You know, like that on a consistent daily basis just checks in. And one of the things that we teach with the progress over perfection thing is just like owning it and fixing it when you can, when you feel capable. If, if you need help with figuring out the tools and the approaches, we can work through that. You it know, sounds like somebody strained you in restorative practices. There's, there's been some of that. wonder who did that. Okay. And some of that. <laughs> no, I, um, yeah, I, I, I'm just very, like I said it before, I'll continue to say it. Like, if not for all of those tools at our disposal that Star Commonwealth has provided and, you know, the, the restorative justice piece, um, it really would be a much more challenging endeavor to try to reach these kids and help them make progress. Like if I was using the same tools I had, uh, not to say, I, I do think the psychology you know, department at yeah. Western Michigan University was fantastic, but it was behavioral, which is important. But I think with the behavioral piece, I don't think you get that trauma-informed lens all the time the same way. There's probably some people that do that right. Um, but I was very much about like, reinforcement, you know, all of those types of concepts, which are, are a piece of the puzzle. But if, if I was leaning on those tools more so than these other things that I've been fortunate enough to learn, it would be a lot more difficult connecting with kids. Well, uh, this just the science has came a long way. Yeah. Um, and I know a lot of behavior interventionists that are actually working on creating the bridge between being trauma informed and still looking at behavior. Because yeah. the behavior is important, right? Because one of the things we talk about is behavior is a clue. Yeah. 
right? So when the kid's saying, F you, Mr. B or they call you Tony, right? Yeah, Mr. Tony. Tony. F you, Mr. Tony. F you, Mr. Tony. Every day when it's time to do math, that behavior is a clue. Oh, yeah. That behavior is communication. So I, I know you don't, that's not, that's not what we're saying. That behavior is not important. No. It's just we can't only deal with that behavior. What's causing? We can't say stop cussing. We can't say just do your work. We got to figure out what is causing that behavior. Oh, 100%. And no, I, I still think, I think the marriage of the two yeah. is really yeah. where you can start Absolutely. to figure out. You know, we have this one young man who we changed the room that he starts in. And then all of a sudden we see an increase in just kind of disruptive behavior, things like that. That room is a discriminative stimulus for a classroom. That's the one that most closely represents a classroom in his actual school. Our other space is a sensory space with all types of awesome things that you can use. The other space is a maker space with all types of, this one looks a lot like a classroom. So like that part of it is important for me too, because I think it helps right. me That's kind of clue, put right? those pieces together. Right. Uh, you know, but if you just, I think I was so focused in the, when I first started on the behavior piece mm -hmm. and what's reinforcing it, and how do we re remove the reinforce, not, not how do we substitute, right? Or whatever. So um, it's just, I think that my hope is that those two can find a way to mm -hmm. uh, converge because I think between the two, then, then you really have a hand, you know, a way to start helping kids find alternatives. There's a lot of people out there doing them. I know we, yeah. we have a trainer that's doing that right now. Yeah. Like, what are some of the biggest barriers in your experience between holding students and staff back from looking at behavior through that trauma-informed lens? Because we are going to look at behavior, like you, just, like you just mentioned, but like, what are the barriers to not just looking at the behavior and like what extinguishes it, what reinforces it, but looking at behavior through that lens of being trauma-informed, resilience-focused? Like, what are some barriers? I honestly think one of the biggest barriers currently and, and for some people is like, discounting the fact that we're all products of our own trauma in some way, <laughs> right? And so, okay, I'm working with a kid. If part of my trauma history is witnessing some sort of abuse in my household, right? And then I have a kid that's demonstrating those types of behaviors. If I am discounting the fact that I'm also in that experience that I've had right now. Experience, that those experiences impacted me in a negative way. And that's gonna change how I, approach situations. That's going to change how I come across with kids, um, which I actually embrace that challenge currently. Like that wasn't always my, my mindset. And I wasn't even really aware of that, but just understanding that I think that I'm in this situation, this conflict with this kid and let's say bullying, for example, if I know that because of my life history, that bullying is, is something that really makes me feel a strong negative emotion when I witness it. If I'm not factoring that into the equation. That's a trigger for me. Oh uh, yeah. yeah. Who, who likes to see, who works with kids and likes to see yeah. a bigger, stronger kid Good mystery point. somebody? Good point. That's I, I don't think it really exists. Now some, I think some adults are better at understanding that bully's mindset and the fact that yes. They're probably just replicating behavior. They can get there quicker. Yeah. But I think if we can't realize our own areas where we're really sensitive to situations, they can kind of sneak up on us. And they can change how we approach a situation and they can make the outcome of our inter intervention actually damaging to the relationship. When it, at, at, at worst, I mean, at worst, we should be shooting for neutral, right? <laughs> like Do no harm is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. At, at worst. So I think that's... Um, because I think that students' behavior will, will go to extremes sometimes, and those can be really impactful on people. Yeah. And you're the person there doing the work. So it's finding that balance of letting that student know, like, hey, here, we're really big on not mistreating other people. That's not something that we're okay with. You know, here are your options. Um, and, and just kind of continuing to send the invitation to that young person, hey, we've got some better options for you if you're open to looking at some alternatives to what you're doing right now. Um, but but really being mindful of ourselves and where we're at with the situation, what's going on. Um, and I think that's something like you, you kind of are always practicing, yeah. right? And you're always being aware of. I hear a lot when I'm working in a school system, I hear a lot about um, people who personalize a kid's misbehavior. Yeah. And I think that's a little bit what you're talking about, right? Yeah. Is we have to take a, a look into what it what, what is it about that behavior that really affects us? Why do we personalize it? 
And so some of that can come through what we've experienced in the yeah. past, right? That we're more sensitive to those kinds of situations. Yeah. And so if we're continuing to like get more triggered or I would use the word activated even when there's a certain scenario, like yeah. what's happened, what has happened to you, right? right. Having that trauma informed lens for ourselves as well. Yeah, I, I think um, that's something that, that really, it, it's, it's, you're making the decision. So if you're, if you're influenced by your emotions in that situation, and it influences your perception. That's why we work on teams though. And thankfully I'm blessed to have a really great team of people and, and just being able to have that barometer for like, mm -hmm. hey, did I overreact to situations or whatever? Because I think if we do, let's say I have a reaction or a response to a kid that maybe was a little bit more extreme than it needed to be. I think, and you helped reinforce this point for me was own it with the kid, follow up. Yeah. Hey, look, man, I snapped at you a little bit. I'm sorry, here's what's going on and here's why that was a problem, but I, I really apologize. I'm gonna work really hard never to do that example, again. Yeah. Uh, which also blows a kid's mind, by the way. It does, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, yeah. wait, what did you just say? You said you're sorry to, you know? Um, but yeah, I don't know, like what, you're out there on the road a lot too. I, I, think, um, I, I think the allure of phones and social media and how that impacts relationships and kids and, mm -hmm. I mean, does that, does that come up a lot, like, while you're out there, the telephone, social media influence in school? And yeah, yeah, teachers. Well, the biggest thing I hear about that is, like, what the rule is in the school and teachers getting into power struggles over that more so than anything else. It's so easy to get stuck on the phone Yeah. when it's really either usually about belonging, connection, or, or it's literally their only coping skill that they right, have in their right, pocket. Right. And they know I'm overwhelmed. I watch TikTok for or they'll play you know, a game. Or, yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So that that is that is something that can create some power struggles for sure. Yeah. Any any other barriers that that you see around helping educators adopt this trauma informed mindset? Like anything that currently with some of the school districts you're working with? Um, Without specific. Whatever's going on at home, you know, that's kind of like the missing piece of the puzzle. I think for schools and us is. Okay, while you're here with us, we know that you have positive, supportive people that are going to try to point you in the right direction. And then I'll have a, a young person come in and say, well, hey, mom, uh, we, we, got, we got my bike by going out and taking it from somebody. So mom told me to go get my little brother a bike, yeah. you know? And that puts us in a very challenging and unique yeah. situation. Um, when the values at home are different than the school norms or... Yeah, which, I mean, I think to... Obviously, I think this whole thing, if you zoom out, is like... It's a systemic issue that's being filtered down from parents to kids and then trickles into schools and programs. And I think that's the hardest piece of... We can try to have all of the things set up in the program or at school, you know? But, but it's really how do we take care of these communities and give these parents tools and resources so they can just go to buy a bike, right, or whatever. Um, so th that's, I think that's the hardest. You know, the, the job that you're, you're signing up to, to work with kids and help kids and deal with challenging behaviors and deal with successes and all those things that come with it. But um, if, if they don't have support at home or if it's not, if it's kind of the opposite of support, it's discouraging at home, right? Yeah. Um, I think that's that's one of the things that still can be a real challenge. But I mean, you see you can see over kids overcome that stuff too, though. Yeah. And then it's like almost even more valuable of a win. Like you had a little yeah. bit more on your plate, and you still did it. Um, so it's, I'm not saying it's like all is no, lost. No, about situations. It's definitely no. a barrier. It makes things a little harder, but it's not insurmountable. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's not. And and you know, I I do think. There are an awful lot of parents that are doing the best they can with what, with what they have, and they're trying to make ends meet, and they're trying to take care of kids. So I'm not uh, trying to disparage any parents involved, right, right, you know. Right, right. But um, it, that part is is challenging. Mm -hmm. um, the other part, though, is that kids listen a lot more than they'll let you know that they're listening. Oh, for sure. You know, and so especially kids who have experienced a lot of trauma or stress in their lives, they become almost hyper attuned to what's going on around them. Yeah. And maybe later in life become people pleasers because they're so used to having to dial into everybody's emotions and they actually know a lot more than we think they do. Yeah, hyper vigilant. Very much so. Very observant too. They're the kids that will notice like, hey, you get a haircut, you right. let me shirt. Yeah. yeah. Um, but so like I, every time I like think about like one of those things like that, those, those barriers can be discouraging for us, but you have to understand like the, these kids are way more 
capable of bouncing back than sometimes people give them credit for. And they're amazing. They're there's a lot of resilience. I mean, I know there's like there's like some conversation in the field about um, don't tell me how strong I was. My tra my trauma hurt me. Well, if we're not diminishing your trauma by saying that you're that you're strong. Yeah. But it's important. Like when we talk about the title of this podcast, right? Constant curiosity, a trauma informed approach. I don't talk about trauma without talking about resilience because there is strength from from crisis and adversity. Yeah. And so we, ha it's not that we're dismissing what happened to you, but we want to take what you've learned from what happened to you and help you continue to overcome that adversity or like the barriers you're talking about. Like wh what we teach you at school or at the rec is really important because then maybe you're faced with that kind of adversity at home or out in your environment, whatever, and you can use those same skills. The skills can, these are life skills we're teaching kids. This isn't just something to get through the school day. Right? No. These are life skills. Well, and, and I think that, you know, like I personally had the opportunity to receive a lot of that guidance from caring adults in my life. Yep. And, um, you know, these, these may be kids that don't really find those naturally. So, you know, we have to show up for them. And, uh, yeah, the resilience piece, we talk about it all the time at the, at the rec center. And the kids know, you know, like, all that, what's resilience mean? It's the ability to bounce back. That's like when you took the ball and you're, yes, okay, cool. How would that apply to this situation at school? What are our tools that help us get there? What are our options? Um, and, and kids, I think, get it. And some of them, you can almost watch them make the switch from being sort of that victim mindset to being, hey, I'm a survivor. Because yes. they have a little bit of pride with it, which they should. They should, know? absolutely. They should. Like, That's a huge transformation in trauma-informed like treatment work is helping kids shift from this happened to me to I survived this. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I think, you know, the, the, the barriers are, are there. They are what they are. Um, but, you know, I, our kids are survivors yeah you know they they survive they adapt i mean so um i think just helping them opt into survival techniques that also lead to better outcomes right. you know we're, we're, we're salespeople at the end of the day right right? <laughs> right well and just you know like i mentioned earlier is we're not justifying behavior by telling kids you were doing those things to survive a situation yeah. like i think of like all the kids that we had in residential is you know when the some of them were in you know, situations where they were getting horrifically abused and their ability to run away, yeah. their ability to fight back, yep. that kept them safe and alive. And so those were survival skills. Now we can teach them how to adapt that in a, in a socially acceptable manner, right? But that strength is in there and we don't want to diminish that or ignore it. We want to expand on that, but in, in ways that are acceptable. Yeah. We have a very, very important guest um, in our podcast today. Yeah. So do you want to talk a little bit about that guest and how he goes into your trauma-informed, what he does to help the trauma-informed mindset approach at, at the rec? Yeah, yeah. This is after a full day of work, so he's a little tuckered out, so you have to forgive him. But this is Baloo. So Baloo is laying uh, down here sort of like a bearskin rug. He's a 135-pound <laughs> okay. uh, St. Bernard Great Dane mix. Um, and he was donated uh, to, to my wife and I because we, we were currently working uh, with kids and he was donated to be a support for those kids. That was the one request. So we got him through some training and everything like that um, and his certification. Um, so he, he's a, a, a large dog. He's an he's a imposing looking figure. He is by far the friendliest, most social dog I've ever had in my life. Um, and really his role at the rec, um, there, there are a handful of kids that will tell you they're his favorite, his, they're his favorite part. They're his biggest coping skill. They're his biggest support. Favorite he's, he's, staff yeah, member. right. Yeah. And so, um, he hangs out, he, he goes around, he, he has this really cool way of identifying people that might seem like they're having a tough day and going up and just kind of gently like, Hey, you good? Just like checking in with them. Um, going up and, and, you know, trying to get food from kids. Sometimes we had a young lady today, you know, sort of reinforcing them with treats in the classroom and getting them used to, he, he gets a little skittish when I'm not around cause he's just been with me his whole life. So, uh, we're trying to get him used to like, Hey, if I'm in the classroom, it's not an emergency. So she was helping reinforce him being in there and everything. She had a little job. She had a little pride with that, which was cool. And, uh, but yeah, he, he's super friendly. Even the preschool 
there at the YMCA, when they're not a part of our program, they will specifically stop by our hallway when they're going up to the, to the uh, recreation area, line up and get a, a blue pet and all of that. So he's a pretty big celebrity there. People love him. Um, he's also the unofficial greeter of the ladies' locker room, which happens to be in our wing <laughs> of the building. <laughs> sometimes that's great. Sometimes they get a little spooked. But, um, yeah, so he uh, he's just really, I think, especially, too, with, you know, you have some kids that have had really negative uh, interactions with dogs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, I can think of at least two young, young men that came into the program the first day. They did not want him around. They were concerned. They didn't even want to be in the same room. One of the young men actually almost got in trouble one day because he went into like an office room where they're having a birthday party for a different, because <laughs> he was trying to get out of the hallway because Baloo is in there. So fast forward to like when he's leaving the program, he's like, this is my dog. I'm taking my dog home, you know? So I think he's also had that um, ability to help teach kids that maybe don't have a great relationship with dogs. Like you can't trust all dogs. Some dogs have had a rough upbringing and not really learn great things but he can be very safe um he's like a giant like heated weighted blanket for some kids right he'll he'll go up and cuddle and all of that stuff so um i, I think you know he, he works he works hard i think if you asked him he would say uh he does a lot of sleeping a lot of napping but uh the kids see, they love him and uh he's he's a really good important part of our team um, sometimes on Mondays, if we're feeling a little down, he'll come in like he's about to lead like a self-help seminar and kind of like <laughs> spin around the room. Like, oh, can, up. oh, yeah, let's go. Um, so he's like our he's like our team mascot, too. So he's, he serves a lot of purpose there. So it's safe to say if you are in a school system and you have the opportunity to engage in a program like this where you could bring some kind of service animal into your school that that would really, you think that would be really beneficial to them? I, I do. I think, and, and even when we were working, um, you know, in the residential yeah. with a lot of the young ladies who had experienced a, a terrible amount of trauma, like a lot, right? Um, his job in that regard, Very complex trauma. right? His job in that regard was simply to lay on them while they were sitting on the couch talking to their therapist. Seems really easy. It was super critical because, like, the therapist would be like, "Listen, she." This young lady had so much more to say today, just seemed so much more calm and relaxed and was able to process some of that really difficult stuff. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think we, we can discount the amount of impact that, like everybody, a lot of people love animals. It might be not necessarily dogs, but just the ability to have that calming impact on somebody. So yeah, I think if you have the ability, um, utilize it. I know that he was specifically bred um, the St. Bernard Great Dane mix because it tends to lead towards a really, really easy go lucky demeanor and really caring about people. I have a Boston Terrier at home who would never make it because she, <laughs> <laughs> she only like trusts like three people. And if she gets in a room with like five, she cowers her ears shake. And so, um, you know, I think there's certain breeds that lend themselves a lot more to it. Um, but yeah, he's, he's a huge hit, uh, at the rec. So sounds like he has a lot of co-regulation cool skills, helping kiddos, regulate when they're starting to get a little activated. And he's also really a good um, a good way to teach them, like he's he's working on stuff too, right? Like he gets anxious when he's away from yeah, me. Yeah, I've mentioned that before, I like yeah. that, yeah. Like he gets anxious when he gets away from me. So what's he start doing? Well, he panics, he tries to leave. He does a lot of things that we might do if we get overly anxious. Yeah. And I don't know, I think- It's um, a good teaching tool for kiddos in that regard, I imagine. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's in some ways, I think, Understanding a concept that's not within ourselves is sometimes an easier way to get a hold of it at first. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of look at, all right, well, how does that? Externalizes the anxiety. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, he's a big hit. Usually it's like, hey, Blue. Oh, hey, Mr. Tony, how you doing? Yeah. You know? All right, so getting back to some questions, um, and you've kind of touched on this throughout all your scenarios, but what would you say are some of the greatest benefits you've seen from that shift as you've made that professional shift to becoming you know, trauma-informed, you know, which includes restorative practices and some of the behavior management techniques that you've trained your, you've trained people in yourself. Yeah. What are some of the benefits that you've seen um, as a result of becoming more trauma-informed? Yeah, I, I think um, it's definitely helped me with understanding behavior and what is causing it, what's, you know, what is the kid getting out of the situation or getting away from. Um, it helps me see it a little bit clearer, a little bit quicker, and then at least be able to start suggesting to the student that they may be trying to get something that we could get another way that would be less problematic for them, in, whether it be in school, like home, whatever. Right, like, 
hey, when you were really mad and, and, you know, doing these things, you were really just trying to get away from this situation that was problematic for you. There was somebody banging loud things or whatever. We were playing this game. I saw you get frustrated. Here's what we can do, right? And being able to offer them um, and explain to them why, you know, like it's not, it's not weird, it's not abnormal. This is like a, a normal response that people will have in these situations. And here's some options. So just being able to kind of show them a little bit of the path as far as what's going on. Um, and on the other side of that, being able to avoid some of the pitfalls, I think of. That's what I was just gonna ask yeah. you. So like, yeah, what would have happened before then? Yeah. yeah. I think just jump, you know, jump into conclusions about, well, I know exactly why you're doing this. You're just doing this to blah, 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 blah. And, and like, like making a lot of assumptions about the kid. Mm -hmm. yeah making a lot of uh, predictions about what their motivation was when I really don't know. Like, I think, uh, I, I love th that this is called constant curiosity because I think that's also one of the big things was shifting from being certain to being curious, yeah. right? And, um, you know, I think if I am going to make a, a question or statement, I'm like, hey, do you mind if I ask you something? It almost looks like you might need somebody to come and sit with you. Just because I notice every time I walk over here, you know, you're starting to get loud and then I have to come back over. Would it just be better if I just sat here, right? And I think, so there's ways to like test out like your little theory about what's going <laughs> on uh, without- Making that assumption. Alienating the yeah, kid yeah. and making them feel like they got to get defensive mm -hmm. and making them feel like you're just gonna jump to all these conclusions, which makes you not seem safe. So I think those have been a lot of the things that have I've grown in personally with that situation. Um, I think just understanding that there might be more going on with this for kid sure, sure. than I have any idea about. And that they may not even have the right tools or skills right now to put into words what those things are. And so just to maintain that, that curiosity about, you know, when was the last time you felt okay? Was it earlier this morning? Was it last yeah, night? When was myself. it? Yeah. You know, walking it back. Um, being patient, being genuine about that, um, being genuine whether it comes to some feedback that you might have for a kid or a, a compliment that you wanna pay to the kid. Um, I think that th those types of things, being able to avoid jumping to conclusions and thinking I'm a mind reader as much and, and those types of things I think is, has, has been really uh, help. Those have been some of the things I've been able to avoid with that lens on. Something that really I totally agree with you, and I have like a thousand thoughts in my head. Shocking, I know. All these thoughts about what you're saying. It's something that really blew my mind. Well, like, and it makes sense, and I just, I guess I'd never been mindful or, or really thought about it, was you think about, you know, kids don't really get a lot of language, you know, to what, they're two, three years old. Is that there's things that happen. When we are, 80% of our brain is developed, you know, approximately, depending on who you're asking, by age three. And you think about, like when kids, we know when kids have, are experiencing a lot of stress and trauma at that young age, their brains grow and develop under the state of that stress and trauma. So their bodies and brains are being bathed in cortisol and adrenaline. Yeah. And so I want you and everybody else listening right now just to stop and think about the last time you were really, really stressed, right? You might have had sweaty palms or your hands are shaking or you're feeling really, really jittery. Like that's us as functioning adults feeling that way. Imagine your body developing under that. And so when you're thinking about what kids have been, when you're saying like what kids have been exposed to, sometimes they don't even know. Yeah. They don't know. It's not even that they, and what you said is true though, is that sometimes they don't have the words to say it. Sometimes they don't even know why they respond that way because it was something that, there's a way that their body and brain developed. Yeah. Well, and I think my biggest question for a long time working with challenging behaviors was, well, we've explained everything to them about what they need to do to be successful here. So why aren't they just choosing to do that? And I think having the, the understanding that like, I can watch as many golf videos <laughs> as I want to, right? Swing angle, all this stuff, tempo, <laughs> yeah. right? I ain't shooting par, probably ever, okay? And so, you know, like the knowledge of it doesn't necessarily mean a functional understanding of how to apply it. So how do you get there, right? And then having being able to start connecting those dots in a patient sort of way are you, are you checked out for the day blue blue slow our, our blue guest has left the room yes that's his, his contract said he had to go um <laughs> but yeah i think just having the understanding that okay so they, they know what's expected of them here 
Um, they understand those concepts, but do they have the ability to apply that understanding in a practical sense at speed in a classroom while all these other things are going on? And then going, okay, what would I need to scaffold? What would I need? How would I need to scaffold that? Um, so ultimately, I think to, the response is it's made me more patient sure. through that process. Um, and it's made me try to really slow down and also understand before I change a thing for a kid or a group of kids, I need to understand that every time I change something to get a, a desired response, I'm also probably going to get some sense. other things that are going to occur that maybe I don't want or maybe I can deal with. Um, but understanding like that, like when you change something, there's multiple ways that it can impact a kid, especially depending on their history, which you may not have all the information about. Or they may not, right? So what's our best bet to not, to not make it any more stressful on this particular kid than it, than it has to be with what we're already trying to accomplish? Uh, where in the past I might have been like, oh, well, just whatever, change his class. I don't care. Oh, Let's, yeah. He'll no, deal no, with it, yeah, right? Yeah. He'll figure it out. He's yeah. a big boy. Like, um, It can be really impactful for kids who are in that state of stress. Like something I've been thinking about when you're talking too is um, like the golf video analogy that we've taught kids how to do it. There's r visual expectations. There's positive reinforcements for doing the right thing, but they're continuing the same behavior. That So now a lot of things I've learned, you know, in my journey is that trauma-informed mindset is, are they in, like, what's going on inside their body? Like, are they in that fight and flight mode? And when they're really stressed or feeling some in, intense negative emotion, they don't have access to that thinking brain, that cognition. Because one of the first things that happens is we talk about, like, we use the examples of the wise, the wise owl, the meerkat, and the tiger. When the, the meerkat tells the tiger there's, there's danger, the tiger's going to either fight or flight. So they're going to argue with us or they're going to run away. And the wise owl says, see ya. So all those things we've taught them, they aren't going to matter because they're in their fight and flight mode. And that's where that, when you, the connection, clear back to one of our first questions, it's about relationships and connections. Because when kids can feel safe, that's when they can have all parts of their brains engaged and they can access their thinking brain, which is what they need for learning, for remembering the coping skills that Baloo taught them, not Mr. Tony. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. That the staff have taught them, right? And so when we expect kids to just, why aren't they doing it? And that's something I've learned too. It's like, what is wrong with this kid? And I was like, I still feel like some guilt about thinking those things and saying those things. It's about what's happened to them or what is happening. Yeah, I mean, could you imagine just walk, walking around with me on a golf course and I'm when I'm messing up my shots, being like, what is wrong with you? It's really simple, right? Not without like, some you just... adult beverage. <laughs> 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 but if you were giving me feedback the same way that traditionally we give kids feedback about things, yeah. it would seem Tony, utterly... Tony, you watched this video last night. Yeah. Why aren't you doing you it You can't right? make this putt? Like, what? It's for six feet, man. Come on. You know, like, it would be wild, right? Like, because um, so I think sometimes it's more ch more challenging than we understand depending on what they got going on. And, uh, mm -hmm. and it's really, like, that's what makes it, though, even more rewarding when you right. see a kid like, okay, I got it. Right. And then you got to be prepared for, you know, and we're going through this a little bit too. Like, okay, I got it for four days. And then on day five, maybe it was particularly stressful. I'm going to dip back into my old backpack of shenanigans for like a day or so. Um, test that stuff out. Nope. It's still not completely working for me. Right. Um, but I think it's hard for us as adults when we see somebody that's been making progress go back. I know it's still, still frustrating and can be difficult for me until I go, wait a minute, I've seen this episode before, right? Um, and it's, and, and I think that's the part of like, okay, just is the trajectory, is the overall trajectory there, right? Do we every once in a while go back to what was comfortable for us? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Even, even if it wasn't serving all of right, it, like our Right, even if that doesn't feel good, we know what it is. Yeah, we know what it is. And that knowing what it is, that provides a, a false sense of that safety that we're all craving and looking for. Yeah. And so... But again, like like one of the first things we talked about, what change in life is a straight arrow up? Yeah. It's up and down, up and down, up and down, right? Yeah. Every change in life, there's a bit of regression. Like I'm thinking back to our motivational interviewing training we had here at STAR is that, especially when we're talking about addiction, expect a relapse. Expect yeah. a relapse in behavior because it's never going to be a straight shot up. There's always going to be, or we're going to re revert a little bit. That's still progress. Yeah. We're still it's still happening less, right? But it's yeah. never just a straight. Oh, I've changed this behavior. I'm never going back to it. No, because we don't we don't really do that as adults. None right? of us do. Like, you what, know? What, 
what change in life has ever been that perfect? Yeah, I mean, like, I can't, I can't tell you how many times I've been like, all right, I'm getting back in shape. That's it. You know what I mean? Like, whatever. Have you, it have you taken a Peloton or idea? We've had this conversation. I, I have. It's been a minute since <laughs> I've been off the Peloton. Um, no, but honestly, like, it's funny because like we we got some uh, a couple of like little exercise, like some movement equipment stuff in the sensory room mm -hmm. there at the at the rack and. Uh, we, I didn't give them like a grand introduction to it. It's like a pull up bar and a dip bar. And then this other, like it's, they just come in and they just start using it. Like, and it's almost like, oh, they need more movement stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's really, it's awesome to see like how those, you know, the, that stuff, you know, I'm, I'm talking about like, oh, I should get back in shape. So I'm like, you know, doing pull ups with the, with the kids and that type of stuff. Very rarely is it a straight shot where you make a decision and just that's changed behavior from then on out. Yeah. All right, so as we wrap up our time together, and thank you so much for sharing your experiences yeah. and, and cracking jokes and all those kinds of things. But <laughs> as you look forward, so like you're looking forward into like what's happening at the rec or just in this field, like you mentioned some things around how even some of our behaviorism uh, professional colleagues are looking at things through a more tra trauma-informed lens. What are some things that you're really excited about or, or what you're looking forward to in the fears? What, what still has you curious? I'm all. I'm always very excited to hear, you know, how how our students are doing, just in school in general. So like, I'm always kind of waiting for like, you know, every we get feedback. Oh, this student, you know, he's doing so much better in class. Those types of things, and it's also just cool to hear of former students that were with us in the pilot. You know, they'll have current students. Hey, he said to say hi. You know, those types of things. Well, that think is about the former student student from what like seven years ago that you and I were just talking about? Or I, I did. 10 years ago? I got a mixtape sent to me by a former <laughs> student. Uh, it's not bad. Beats are pretty good, you know? Uh, but no, like, I think just being able to, from, from the pilot when we started it last March to now, our ability to design an environment, you know, that's more meeting of the kids' needs that we're serving has improved vastly, right? Like, not to say the pilot was bad. It was just, we've really been able to take feedback mm -hmm from the kids either verbally or non-verbally about what they need and apply it. Mm -hmm. So I really look forward to, okay, what's next year gonna look like? Cause I already feel very proud of the work that we're doing and what we have going on at the rec. Um, but well, what you said, if you're not growing, right, what are you doing? Yeah, you know, and I don't think our team would really be okay with just kind of staying right. stagnant anyways. We, I think probably more so we need to then, we need to breathe a little bit more and give ourselves credit for how far we've come because we're always I know anytime we hear about a kid getting suspended or something like that, I can take that personally a little bit. Like, oh, sure what do. in the world is happening? We talked about, you know, so I think, but just as far as what I'm looking forward to, um, being able to continue to really kind of customize what we're offering to get that student to really be excited about showing up, know that they're going to be challenged in some ways. Their thinking might be challenged. They might have to overcome some things they didn't think they could do, but Watching them build up the courage to succeed with that, I think really being able to, you know, specify for our kids, we, we've really been able to put a lot more focus on the academic portion of things where, you know, it's not like we hadn't incorporated that before, but our biggest focus has traditionally been like social emotional learning, executive functioning, uh, emotional regulation stuff. So as we're getting into that, um, being able to watch some of our students um, transition through middle school and, and get into high school. We've got a bunch of kids that are super into athletics and, you know, I think watching them go out into the world and be successful is, is always kind of the main priority. Um, but just, then as a, as a team, just getting um, that much sharper with how quickly we can try to figure out what we need to change about our environment to get this student to show up and be excited about being there and be able to let us know just what they need, right? Like sometimes that's the, the biggest thing. So I think that's cool. Um, I'm looking forward to you doing some more trainings with us this summer. I'm nice, sure, yes. I love I'm my sure we get group. some signed up, you know? <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I just, uh, I'm very proud of our team and, and our kids and uh, what we've been able to accomplish so far. So I, I just really look forward to, okay, where are we gonna be like a year from now? Like, I wonder what we're going to, you know what I mean? And being able to kind of think about that and start making those changes and put those things in place is probably the thing that I get the most thrilled about. Um, and just hearing that a kid that was struggling before is yeah. not, you know? Well, you have such a key mindset. I love what you just said is that what can we do about our environment? And I'm thinking of, I just was reviewing some training material today with some colleagues. 
is like, what do we do if a plant, a flower is not growing? We fix the environment the plant is in, right? Yeah. We add fertilizer, we add light, we add water. And too often we're looking at what's wrong with this kid instead of how can we adapt the environment to meet that student's needs. And so you just, I just love that you said that is we, we need to figure out how we can best meet the environment. And every year you've been adapting, right, is, you know, we need to focus more on academics this year. So that's such a key mindset is instead of, um, and we want to absolutely look at behavior. We want to, when we're, we're talking with our colleagues or working with our kids, we want to, we want to be t- looking at behavior like, and thinking about what has happened or what is happening to this child, but also how does that environment impact that child and how can we adapt the environment? So thanks for that. That was an awesome wrap up question there or, or, or a statement there about that change in that environment. That's a key piece to it. Instead of always at the kids, the problem, we got to look at the environment as well. Well, thank you so much. The kids at the rec and the staff there are lucky to have you. Thank Um, you. So enjoy your time together. Of course, our time with Baloo. He's always a great addition to the group. We're always like, let's invite Tony because the dog's coming. (laughs) Anyway, thank you so much. Yeah, no, thank you. It's been awesome. And uh, yeah, I, uh, I appreciate what you're doing and how you're doing it.